The Intermeccanica Italia is a unique sports car that blends Italian craftsmanship with American muscle. This car has an interesting history, from its creation to why it eventually became lost. Intermeccanica was founded in 1959 by Frank Reisner, a Hungarian-Canadian who moved to Italy with his wife, Paula. The company started by making performance parts for small European cars. They also created a few racing cars, including a Formula Junior open-wheel racer and the Intermeccanica Puc, or IMP. The IMP made a name for itself by winning the 500cc class at the Nürburgring, but the project didn't last long because of business politics. Intermechanica's first full car project was the Apollo GT. The Apollo GT had a Buick engine and a stylish body, but it faced money problems that held it back. This led to working with Jack Griffith, resulting in the Griffith 600. The Griffith 600 went through several changes and improvements, eventually becoming the Italia. Mainly, Robert Cumberford designed the Italia, and Franco Scaglione refined it. John Crosswaite, who had experience in Formula One, developed its chassis. These collaborations resulted in a car that combined sleek Italian design with strong American engineering. Production began in 1966, and the first models were sent to the United States fully assembled. The car was initially named Torino, but due to a trademark issue with Ford, it was renamed Italia. The Intermechanica Italia's design stands out with its sleek steel body, pointed nose, and smooth roofline. It has push-button doors, a large trunk, and round quad taillights. These design elements made it practical while keeping its exotic appeal. The car's steel body was carefully crafted in Turin, Italy, where Intermechanica's factory was located. This attention to detail in the bodywork added to its visual appeal and durability. Under the hood, the Italia was equipped with Ford V8 engines. They started with the 289 cubic inch, later used the 302, and finally the 351 Windsor. These engines were known for their reliability and power. The Italia's engine and mechanical parts were shipped from the United States to Italy, where they were installed in the chassis. This combination of Italian design and American power made the Italia special. The Italia's suspension system was designed to balance comfort and performance. The front suspension had coil springs and telescopic shock absorbers, while the rear used leaf springs with a live axle. This setup allowed the Italia to handle well on both smooth and rough roads, ensuring reliable stopping power. had a four-barrel Holley carburetor and produced substantial horsepower. This engine allowed the Italia to go from zero to 60 miles per hour in about 6.2 seconds. The top speed was over 155 miles per hour, making it a competitive sports car in its time. The combination of a powerful engine and a lightweight steel body gave the Italia impressive performance. The transmission was a four-speed manual, which provided a direct and engaging driving experience. The gearbox was known for its durability and smooth shifting, enhancing the car's overall performance. The Italia's rear axle came from the Ford Mustang, further adding to its robust mechanical setup. Inside, the Italia was designed for both comfort and function. It had bolstered adjustable seats that provided good support during spirited driving. The seats were covered in high-quality materials, adding to the car's luxurious feel. The dashboard had a full set of instruments, including a tachometer, ammeter, and oil pressure gauge. These instruments gave the driver all the necessary information to monitor the car's performance. The Italia also came with a Ford AM-FM radio, power windows, and a heater defroster, making it comfortable for both short and long drives. Some Italias had custom touches, like a Motolita steering wheel. The interior was spacious for a sports car, with enough room for the driver and passenger to sit comfortably. The large trunk provided plenty of storage space, making it practical for longer trips. Despite its impressive design and performance, the Intermechanica Italia faced several challenges that led to its decline. One big issue was the financial instability and logistical challenges of producing cars in Italy and shipping them to the United States. The cost of production was high, and the company struggled to make a profit.
Additionally, the oil crisis of the 1970s made people prefer more fuel-efficient cars, further reducing the demand for high-performance sports cars like the Italia. And eventually, Intermechanica switched to building replica cars in the 1970s, which proved to be more financially viable. The company became known for its high-quality replicas of the Porsche 356 Speedster and other classic models. Today, the Intermechanica Italia is a highly sought-after collector's car. Its mix of Italian design and American power makes it a unique piece of automotive history. Restored models can sell for between $130,000 and $200,000, showing how desirable they are among classic car enthusiasts. Collectors value the Italia for its distinctive design, strong performance, and limited production numbers. With only about 500 units built, the Italia is a rare find in the classic car market. Its unique combination of Italian styling and American engineering continues to attract enthusiasts and collectors from around the world. The Iso Grifo is a fascinating car with a rich history. Produced between 1965 and 1974 by the Italian company Iso Autovecoli. The Iso Grifo was designed by Giorgetto Giugiaro at Pertoni and engineered by Giotto Bizzarini, who had previously worked on the Ferrari 250 GTO. The Iso Grifo came to life through a team up between Renzo Revolta, Giotto Bizzarini, and Giorgetto Giugiaro. Revolta, who used to make fridges and scooters, had already dipped his toes into car making with the Iso Revolta IR300, a big touring car. He wanted to add a speedy sports car to his lineup. Bizzarini, who used to work for Ferrari, knew how to make fast cars. Giugiaro, a young designer at Bertone, gave the car its cool look. In 1963, they showed off two versions of the Iso Grifo, the A3L for luxury, But soon after, Revolta and Bizzarini split up because they didn't agree on the company's future. Iso started making the Grifo GL, Grande Luso, in 1965. It kept a lot of the prototype's design, but had some changes to make it better for driving on roads. It had a shorter wheelbase and a special weight balance that made it handle really well. The car had a steel body on a platform frame. At first, Bertona made the bodies, but later Iso made them themselves. The Iso Grifo used engines from American car makers, mostly Chevrolet. The first models, called Series 1, had Chevrolet's 5.4 liter V8 engine, also known as the 327 small block. This engine made between 300 and 350 horsepower, depending on how it was set up. The power went through a Borg Warner 4 speed manual gearbox, but you could also get a ZF 5 speed or an automatic if you wanted. In 1968, they came out with the Grifo 7 Litri, which had Chevrolet's 427 big block V8 engine. This engine was way more powerful, making up to 435 horsepower. To fit this bigger engine, they had to change the car's design a bit. They added a bigger hood scoop and made the frame stronger to handle all that power. The 7 Litri was one of the most powerful cars you could buy back then. Later models, called Series 2, came out in 1970 and used the Ford 351 Cleveland V8 engine. This engine wasn't quite as strong as the 427, but it still packed a punch. The Series 2 also got a new front end with headlights that were partly covered. Inside the Isogrifo, everything was fancy and comfy. They used high-quality materials all over, with leather seats being pretty common. The dashboard was simple, but worked well, with all the important gauges and controls easy to see and use. The seats were made to keep you comfy on long drives. You could get air conditioning if you wanted, which was a big deal back in the 1960s and 1970s. The car also had power windows, another fancy touch that not many cars had back then. The whole inside of the car was designed to feel really nice, mixing Italian craftsmanship with practical features. Now, the Iso Grifo became rare for a few reasons. The big one was the oil crisis in the 1970s. When gas prices went way up, people didn't want big, thirsty sports cars anymore. They started buying cars that didn't use as much gas. Also, there was a lot of political trouble and worker strikes in Italy in the late 1960s and early 1970s. This made it hard for small car companies like ESO to keep making cars. 
There were also some dangerous groups like the Red Brigade causing problems, which made rich people scared to buy or make fancy sports cars. And finally, ESO had to shut down in 1974. They couldn't handle all the problems with the economy, politics, and changes in what people wanted to buy. The ESO Grifos that were left became collector's items. People loved them because they mixed Italian design with American engines. There aren't many left today, partly because they only made about 400 of them, and many got lost or damaged over time. Today, car collectors really want to get their hands on an ESO Grifo. They love how it combines Italian style with American power. Fixing up and taking care of an ESO Grifo takes a lot of work and money. People often have to look all over the world to find the parts they need. The ATS 2500 GT was an Italian sports car created by Automobili Turismo Sport, ATS, a company founded in 1962 by former Ferrari employees. These employees left Ferrari due to internal conflicts, including disputes with Enzo Ferrari's wife. Led by Carlo Citti and Giotto Bizzarini, they aimed to compete with Ferrari by building both a road car and a Formula One car. These guys had big plans. They wanted to make cars that could compete with Ferrari both on the racetrack and on regular roads. They started working on a Formula One car and a road car at the same time, which was a pretty big task. Unfortunately, things didn't go so well with their Formula One car. It didn't do well in races, which caused a lot of problems for the company. They lost money, and people who had invested in the company started to worry. Even though they were having trouble with the F1 car, they kept working on their road car. In 1963, they showed off the ATS 2500 GT at a big car show in Geneva. The car looked really good, thanks to its designer Franco Scaglione, who used to work for Bertoni. A well-known company called Carrosseria Aemano built the body of the car. One of the cool things about the ATS 2500 GT was that its engine was in the middle of the car, not in the front like most other cars at the time. This made the car handle better because the weight was spread out more evenly. It was a new idea for road cars and made the ATS 2500 GT stand out. Even though people liked the car when they saw it at the show, ATS had a hard time selling many of them. The company was having money problems, made worse by their failed Formula One efforts. In the end, they only made 12 ATS 2500 GT cars before they had to shut down in 1964. Now, let's talk about what made the 2500 GT special. It had a 2.5 liter V8 engine that could make about 220 horsepower and 188 pound-feet of torque. And Giotto Bizzarini, who also made engines for Lamborghini, designed this engine. It was small, but powerful, which helped the car perform well without being too heavy. The car had a 5-speed manual transmission made by a company called Kaladi. This gearbox let drivers use all of the engine's power and made the car fun to drive. With this setup, the 2500 GT could go up to about 150 miles per hour. They also made a lighter version called the GTS that could go even faster, up to 160 miles per hour. Another cool feature of the ATS 2500 GT was its suspension system. Both the front and back suspensions were designed to make the car handle well on regular roads and racetracks. The car also had disc brakes on all four wheels, which was better than the drum brakes many other cars used at the time. You could get the GT with either a steel body or a lighter aluminum body. The aluminum version, called the GTS, was made for better performance. It was lighter, which made it faster and better at turning. Inside the car, everything was set up to focus on the driver. The dashboard was simple and easy to use, with all the important gauges and controls right where you needed them. The seats were made to keep you comfortable even when driving fast. Even though the ATS 2500 GT was a good car, they just couldn't make enough of them to make money. It was expensive to make, which meant they had to sell it for a high price. This made it hard for many people to buy. By the end of 1964, ATS had to close down. And today, the few ATS 2500 GT cars that are left are very rare and valuable. Most of them are owned by private collectors and aren't seen in public very often. Sometimes they show up at big car shows or auctions, where car enthusiasts get really excited to see them. In 2017, some people tried to bring back the ATS name with a new car based on a McLaren. 
But this new ATS hasn't become very well known, and most people still think of the original 1960s car when they hear the name ATS. The Monica 560. Started as a dream of Jean Testevin, a French businessman who loved cars. Back in 1967, he wasn't happy with the luxury cars available, so he decided to make his own French car that could compete with big names like Jaguar and Mercedes. Testevin wanted to bring back the glory days of French luxury cars, like the old Delage, Delahaye, and Bugatti brands. He named the car after his wife Monica and planned to make about 400 cars each year. Testevin wanted every part of the car to be made in France, which turned out to be pretty tough, especially when it came to finding a good French engine maker. To keep the project secret in French, they built the first prototype cars in England. These early versions had a 3-liter V8 engine designed by Ted Martin, a British expert in powerful engines. But as they tested these cars, they realized the engine wasn't strong or smooth enough for a fancy car. So they switched to a bigger 3.5 liter V8 engine, which worked much better. The car's look also changed over time, with help from famous designers and car builders like Vignal and Chapron. The Monica 560's design was a team effort. At first, C.J. Lawrence consultants in London worked on it. They aimed for a sleek four-door car that looked elegant and luxurious. David Coward from James Young, a well-known British car builder, added some fancy touches to make it look even better. The car made its big debut at the Paris Motor Show in 1972. It had a streamlined body and a fancy interior, showing off its aim to be one of the best cars in the world. The Monica 560 had a long hood and a roomy inside, and was built with top quality materials to make it strong and feel expensive. They made the Monica 560 in a special part of Jean Testevin's factory in Balbigny, near Saint-Étienne, France. But even though they wanted to make hundreds of cars each year, they ran into lots of problems. Making a unique luxury car with custom parts was complicated and expensive. Plus, the oil crisis made people less interested in big cars that used a lot of gas. In the final version of Monica 560s, they used a big 5.6-liter Chrysler V8 engine. This was a big step up from the smaller Martin V8 engine they used in the prototype. They chose the Chrysler engine because it was reliable and powerful, making about 285 horsepower. This made the Monica 561 of the fastest four-door cars of its time, able to reach speeds of about 150 miles per hour. Buyers could choose between a Chrysler Torque Flight automatic transmission or a ZF five-speed manual gearbox, giving them options for how they wanted to drive. The car also had advanced suspension, including a Didion rear suspension, which made it ride smoothly and handle well. Inside, the Monica 560 was all about luxury and comfort. It had high quality leather seats and wood trim, making it look and feel very fancy. The car could seat four people comfortably and had modern features for the time, like air conditioning and electric windows. The dashboard was designed to be easy for the driver to use, with all the important gauges and controls in good spots. The car also had advanced sound systems, giving drivers and passengers great sound quality as they drove. The Monica 560's fancy interior was a big selling point, appealing to buyers who wanted style and sophistication. But even with all this work, the project ran into money problems and delays. The oil crisis in the early 1970s made things worse, as people weren't buying big, thirsty cars as much. And in the end, they only made about 35 Monica 560s, including the test versions and the final cars. This small number made the car very rare, but it also showed how hard it is for small car makers to stay in business. Today, the Monica 560 is a rare and valuable collector's car. Its rarity comes from the financial problems the project faced and the changing economy of the 1970s, which made it hard to sell luxury cars. Car collectors and enthusiasts love the 560 because of its unique place in car history and how it shows off French engineering and design goals.